thing. It's gotta go somewhere now. Just find somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> I think musical chairs. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Ruben's all over his face. <laughs> right. It's getting nice out there, too. Yeah, it's supposed to be like 50 something for that. Mm-hmm. All right, boys. So what we're going to start talking about, uh, I know we talked about this, that we were going to discuss it a lot in the past two weeks. So this is basically dynamic systems theory in sports rehab, but it just concerns overall like movement variability and like where we're at in the process. So, so, so what is the dynamic systems theory? So dynamic systems theory basically states that movement and behavior is a complex interaction between many different subsystems in the body the task at hand and the environment. It explains how dynamic movement is optimized and then states the intelligence that coordinates the body is not localized in any one particular part, but emerges from the interactions of all the different parts inside the overall system, which when we mention system in this for the most time is gonna be the full human body. Um, so the classic method that we learn in PT school or we learn through movement or in undergrad it basically assumes that all mov- movers should aspire to a common idealized movement pattern. So we see this a lot with like squats or lunge. It should look like a, everyone's tight should look a certain way. Feet should be this way, knees should be this way, back and hips should be a certain um, angle or position. It assumes there is a right and a wrong way to move. And then it assumes that if the patient isn't moving in that certain way, there's a predictable cause. Um, and then it also assumes that the clinician or the practitioner in front of the person knows what the right and wrong way to move is and what's the difference on why they're moving it. And then it requires internal focus by the person performing the movement um, about the patient. It will focus on what their body is doing in space inside rather than the task at actually at hand, whether it's squatting or lunging or moving or running. So then to kind of like digress from the sciencey part, bringing back to some MD, MDT concepts, like is this how humans actually learn to move? So when a child's learning to walk, does he actually watch his parents analyze it and be like okay mom is putting their foot this way this degree of dorsiflexion and this degree of knee flexion and then i'm going to get off and i'm going to do it exactly like that and if i don't do it it's wrong and i can sit back down and go back to crawling like that's not how humans really learn to walk or move in any capacity what they really do is they um get up they try the movement or they try the overall function and if it's not right or they don't feel comfortable they do something to stabilize and then they progress from there to develop some more stability um this is an interacting, like I guess, concept that goes along with dynamic systems theory and just general overall function of movement and movement progressions. It's just this Newell's model of interacting constraints. Um, just something to keep in mind as we go forward that when we're progressing in our motor development is that constraints are um, basically the individual or the organism that's performing the movement. <clears throat> so whatever constraints they have, whether it's structural, functional, that could be um, joint range of motion, mobility, strength, capacity, whatever the environmental constraints, so anything that's going on around you, and then the task constraints, obviously you're trying to achieve a certain task, so if you're kicking a ball, that limits you from throwing the ball, because that's not the task at hand that's constraining you for the movement. Um, and then you, you think about how these all these constraints interact, and that is what uh, begins to drive the actual movement. So then, before we kind of move on to getting deeper into this stuff, just to kind of describing what purposeful movement is. I didn't look this definition up anywhere. I just stole it off my head when I was typing up these slides. So it, there's not very sciencey or, but purposeful movement is any change in body position used to achieve a specific task. So anything we're trying to do, whether it's reaching up in the cabinet to grab a dish or it's throw a fastball 95 miles an hour, that's the purposeful movement that we're trying to achieve. It can only be understood by the context of the environment. So something that might be purposeful in one environment is not necessarily purposeful in another. Um, and then what makes this, starting to dive deep to it, what makes um, DST different from other theories? And then these four bullets right here are the main stuff that we're gonna talk about. So synergies, which is um, essentially, it just describes that it's not an isolated movement and that um, the movement may or may not be occurring because of the individual movement. So if isolated movement and the muscle function is absent, then the synergy that's going on is compromised. Um, a good quote here is that the brain does not know muscles, only movements. And what this basically is referring to is that the body is like operating in patterns and we're not operating. You're trying to achieve the task. You're not just operating by thinking, okay, bicep flexion, supination to eat. Like you're obviously going to go through the full task uh, as a pattern. Um, synergies also highlight the nervous system tendencies to create um, movement for the sake of efficiency. So whatever you're gonna do, you're gonna do so the most efficient your body feels the most stable. Um, in the synergy kind of concept, 
independence is a prerequisite for interdependence. So basically what that means is that you'll have these like two schools of thoughts, typically where people are like either isolated movements, isolated movements, work on that, or pattern, pattern, pattern. But here we kind of think that uh, they kind of work together because without being able to, if you have a weak link in the entire pattern, it's not gonna make the most efficient pattern. Again, you can compromise to achieve the actual goal of the task, but the pattern may not be, or may be, how you want it to like look or not look. Um, and then to optimize movement, we also have to optimize joint function. And then nonlinear, we won't dive as much into, but movement variability is one of the principles here in this theory that we'll dive like super deep into, even in this presentation. And then the self-organizing principle at the end. So synergies, um, neural, not just muscle, organization of a multi-elemental system. So essentially what happens is that it's not, when we're moving, it is not just our muscles are moving. We gotta remember that's a whole system from all the way up from your brain to um, upper motor neurons, lower motor neurons, delivering uh, input into muscles. So organized sharing of tasks among a wide set of variables. So like I said, motor, ner motor uh, neurons, motor units, joints, muscles, etc. And then the co-variation um, among connective tissue stabilizes. So stability with flexibility. It's basically saying that like, it's not looking for one specific uh, like pattern or movement is kind of, they're all gonna interact with each other. So uh, what I have written down here is like that one muscle can potentially play a minor role in synergy while it plays a major role in another synergy. So um, that same muscle may have the uh, potential to switch from being a stabilizer in one synergy and then a prime mover in another, depending on what you're actually looking to do. So muscles don't always have one specific function or one specific role. A muscle is able to achieve different roles depending on what the body is trying to pattern for that specific task. Um, so you keep in mind the environment, task, and synergy uh, of abundance may help shift, shift us away from the idea of right versus wrong movement patterns and then towards the idea of coaching variability within a normal range that accomplishes a desired task in a specific environment. Uh, go ahead, Dylan. How are you? you feel like Um, yeah, so essentially what, what the synergy is is that there's less right versus wrong and more is that um, the variability is good but when it's within a specific limit for a task. So nonlinear, I think it's an important part of the overall DST, like in dynamic systems theory, because how they teach us in PT school and how you learn kind of getting older, like or through um, school in general and how you learn movement is that um, it's very linear. Like, you do one pattern and then that can lead you to do another thing, which can lead you to do another thing. But in all reality, like life and learning movement isn't like that. So um, basically in a linear a model, the output is equal to the input. So if you have adequate knee, hip, ankle range of motion, you'll be able to lunge properly. But if one is not, you won't be able to lunge at all, which isn't really the case. So you have to look at it as a overall general movement pattern and that I believe that this is kind of just for me too, that the nonlinear uh, or the linear view of movement, it makes it a, uh, it's a real reductionist view. So it simplifies something that is absolutely like extremely, extremely complex. Um, it's limited, not optimal, but it's also necessary because you have to realize that sometimes it is A before B and you can't put the horse before the carriage, right? So it's kind of, again, we don't go fall at these extremes where we never look at it one way and always look at it a different way, we fall somewhere in the middle. But then the nonlinear model, the output is not equal to the input, which basically means that changing one variable can have a great effect. Um, I have a couple examples that I was thinking of when I was creating this down here that I'll go over. But motor, motor learning progresses not linearly depending on the task, conditions, and characteristics of the learner. So it can differentiate between person to person and the reasons can be like completely different. So one uh, example that I came up with that, say an ACL patient does a lunge with good strength of the muscles, adequate range of motion when you test everything. A linear model would say like, okay, because we have the strength now and we have the range of motion, let's just look at the coordination. And then the coach or the PT or whoever, the rehab specialist that would be going through it would be like, okay, just make sure your knee goes over the toes for this rep. Make sure your knee goes over the toes for that rep. But when you look at it, that there's so much more going on than just biomechanics inside of um, one single rep or multiple reps of a lunge. So discussing this motor control requires more abstract thinking compared to a standard biomechanical model, which would be that, okay, Joint range of motion is fine, strength's fine, it's a coordination issue. 
you need to kind of look at it as more of an abstract or general view. So in the non-linear uh, model theory, we would change, if you change one variable in the movement system, just say a joint mobility or their belief system or something else, as long as we bring that variable to what they, to like what we raise up to like a critical value, so it basically means the variable that we improve, um, improves enough to improve the whole entire uh, movement, we can change the movement system altogether without even touching the, the other variables. So that's kind of just looking like this. So say, like using that same lunge as an example of an ACL, say we have a ton of, um, say we have a ton of range of motion and not a lot of strength, right? So, all right, let's actually make it a little bit easier. So say we have limited range of motion, dorsiflexion, knees fine, but we have a limited hip range of motion as well. Um, if we just focus, say you're an absolute monster, right? Um, gaining dorsiflexion range of motion. If we just focus on improving dorsiflexion range of motion, that could potentially improve the whole entire pattern because we improved one thing, right? So that's where the inputs aren't necessarily equal to the output. You change one thing in the input and the output made a way bigger um, gain because you changed one small variable that's inside that equation. Um, so just that's kind of how you think about, whoops, I'm still in the nonlinear. So that's kind of how you think about these nonlinear um, models for movement or just human function in general. So now I'm kind of getting more into the movement variability, which is kind of like the meat potatoes <coughs> of this presentation. So human movement in which multiple degrees of freedom uh, of the body, including joints, muscles, nervous system, combined with external forces during movement to produce uh, countless patterns, forms, and strategies, multiple performance variations for each movement. What that basically means is that Every time you perform a rep, even whether it's walking or, or swimming, and even if you're the best at it, every time there's a little bit of variation. Even if you think of me just standing up here where it looks like I'm not doing anything, there's still a little bit of sway, so there's variation in even just a smooth, uh, like the motion of standing up. Um, you gotta think about it now as the movement variability. So when we see someone doing that lunge, maybe the variability isn't er error, but it's necessary for the optimal function of that. Um, and we'll, what that means, we'll dive a little bit deeper into it as we get into it. So having variability in movement should be a focal point, actually, in, especially in the beginning of like rehab stages. So a patient requires variability, variability to achieve optimal function. And the variability reflects multiple options for movement and does not rely on rigid movement patterns for each task. So um, in the beginning of rehab, when you're seeing people that have these sub, what we typically think of like suboptimal patterns, it's just variability inside of a single pattern from what we know. So a lack of variability actually reflect important information for the maintenance of the system. Reduced variability is known to cause repetitive stress in a mechanical sense, but while it appears to be a mechanical problem, it might be more of an information problem. So while we, we're looking at um, someone come back from an ACL injury doing a lunge and we see maybe some knee valgus, maybe it's actually not a mechanical problem anywhere along the chain, but it's an input that's going to the muscle or the movement pattern it's actually the problem. So it's the information that we're driving to the system. Um, so essentially think of that along the lines of that variability, there's like a, a range for it. Now, if, if it's absolutely crazy and they can't control it at all, the lunging pattern, then maybe we do need to kind of like step in and cue it a little bit. But when there's a little bit of variability, what we might want to do is just kind of let them perform that pattern and feel it out for themselves. Now, you don't want to get to the point where you think they're driving a poor pattern and just kind of reinforcing it, but maybe they are figuring out what pattern is best for them. So now to kind of dive a little bit deeper into the science part of it. So a lack of variability can lead to abnormal mapping of the sensory cortex, and that'll disturb motor function. So movements that allow the, the variability avoid the abnormal mapping and contribute to the neuroplasticity needed for achieving function and skill. So obviously too much variability would be a problem, but if you're not letting them get variability at all and actually like move their body in space and see how it, like they're moving and let them feel it out, then what happens is we get like less suboptimal motor planning up in your brain. So then it's gonna drive suboptimal impulses down to your muscle to actually perform the patterns. So uh, I'm gonna continue along the movement variability thing. So the importance of this variability is because it encompasses normal variation of movements that occurs over multiple rep repetitions of a task. So it reflects important information of the maintenance of the health system and then variability within existing not developing state of movement is important to skillful movement in adults. So that means like, I don't want you just to think of this as learning a task, even when people think they're efficient, it's important to have variable um, 
vari like variability within their like mm -hmm. tasks that they're progressing on that they've already learned. Um, so why isn't variability considered error? So when we're, we're doing that lunch and we say, why is it not, why should we not jump on it and be like, okay, that is actually an error and we need to correct that. If it was an error, then more skillful individuals would have less variability, right? So if, if it was an error, then that would never happen in the absolute pros of doing that. But what we realize is that the opposite is actual, actually true. Individual, individuals who use a high degree of vari variability at the beginning of a task, um, at the beginning of task development, actually have greater success in performing the task long term. And I just kind of came up with another example. Um, so this is going to be like a golfer just because it's on the top of my head. But So think about a golfer. So initially a golfer will have a high degree of variability when they're just learning how to swing. So you step up to the ball, this guy's sitting on the range, just say for a year straight, never played golf before. So he's gonna have a high de uh, degree of variability in his swing as he's learning to hit the ball straight, right? As he's picking up on the what's working, he will change that movement pattern himself and know what is working and what is not working. But then as he progresses through the learning the movement task, the variability will decrease as he becomes more of an expert in the transition to learning the task better because of what he learned before in the movement pattern. So he's basically himself adjusting how he's moving because of the variability that was there before. So then um, he's using multiple strategies to hit the ball straight, but as he progresses, he'll reduce the strategies to find what works. But then as he becomes an expert, he will again increase the variability. So after he comes over that hump, he's gonna increase the variability again because what he'll have to do is again, now we're looking at those constraints, the environment may change, or he might have wind, or he might be hitting from sand, or a different lie. So that he will be so good at that initial swing that the variability will allow him to change and also be successful. Again, the variability helps him to learn the swing as it's changing and hitting from different environments or within different constraints. So that's kind of like an overall movement. So I want to kind of dial it into physical therapy a little bit. So in physical therapy, the variability at the beginning of a, may seem like error because the task is not performed efficiently, but it's actually necessary to map the possibilities of the movement of the task further down the line. So basically what we said, we're talking about, that error is necessary and the variability is necessary for them to learn how to do that movement. Um, and then I just had another example, like a patient with an ACL repair um, might exhibit a significantly more rigid and predictable walking pattern than healthy controls. Oh no, this is actually from a study that I was reading during this. So patients with ACL repair exhibit a significantly more rigid and predictable walking pattern than healthy controls, which suggests a decrease in system complexity and narrowed functional responsiveness. So because a lot of ACL um, repairs are told to walk a certain way, like, okay, we got to heel toe, don't let your knee cave in, um, don't move your hip like that. When they actually do the studies and watch them walk down the line, it's a lot more rigid. Whereas if you watch me walk, there might be some differentiation in how I walk each step and how I land each step, depending on if I'm walking from the turf to the um, to the rubber or if I'm walking around something. But whereas ACLs, if they're people with ACL reconstruction, what th we see is that they come back and they actually have, uh, it's just a rigid walking pattern that's pretty continuous, which shows that they don't have the adaptability because maybe there wasn't variability earlier in the program to allow them to learn that pattern down the line. Um, so I'm gonna kind of move on. So then the last principle of that dynamic systems theory was self-organizing, and this can get like crazy deep. So I didn't really dive, like this can get like super sciencey. So I didn't dive too much into it. But when a system of individual parts comes together, its elements behave collectively in ordered way. So what I wrote down here, is there a possibility that movement can be fo formulated by the consequent parts of orchestrating among themselves without higher order instruction or from a higher order motor programs within the CNS? What that basically means is, is there at times um, things that we do, so whether it's breathing or walking, that are not actually driven from our central nervous system and that our body is just self-organizing because it's so used to doing it a certain way. I'm not even gonna dive into that, but that's kind of like the, like the third principle or the fourth principle there. <clears throat> um, so here I kind of want to drive home. So how our body moves from a stable to an unstable, but then eventually back to a stable position. So in certain dynamical systems and under certain conditions, when variability increases and reaches a specific critical point in the system, it becomes highly unstable and switches to a totally new movement pattern. So the way to think about this is if, you, like if you're walking, right, we're really stable when we're walking. But if we started picking up our speed, we would eventually hit a certain critical point 
where we would no longer have that walking pattern and it would now look like jogging. And if you think about jogging, it's the same thing. The pattern would change when you pick up enough speed to move from jogging to sprinting because it's our body putting us in a more stable pattern because if we were trying to stay walking, but also at a jogging pace, well, obviously something would happen. So our body's putting us like, so maybe we would fall or maybe we would tip over or whatever, I don't know. But our body moves us to a more stable pattern like the jog so that we can keep up with the speed while also maintaining our um, overall upright posture. So what can increase variability? So it could be speed, it could be surface, task, environment, like a million different things could increase the variability of a movement. Does that make sense? Yeah. Um, and so this is kind of, I'm leading into like the end of what we're gonna talk about, but we have to look at movement as an emerging property. So it emer emerges from the interactions of multiple elements that self-organize based on certain dynamic properties of the elements themselves and then has external internal constraints. Alterations in movements can be explained by both physical limitations and neuromuscular control and neural structures. So if you look at it, it's not just biomechanical principles, it's just a, not just muscles, tendons, and ligaments. It's not just neurons, it's the whole system working together. Plus there's a million other things that might go into something like this to look at a movement, a subsystem. So it might be overall stress, which I guess you would put in the central nervous system, but it might be, um, Fear, it might be, I guess that's another central nervous system, but you can see where I'm going with that there's other things outside. It might be overall training load, it might be experience. It might, there's a million different things that could happen that could affect a movement pattern. So that's why you can't just take a um, reductionist like biomechanical view of movement. You can't just say, okay, a lunge needs to be done this way with our knee hitting this degree in an upright posture because that's not really how movement is learned and that's not how successful movement is learned. Uh, so then the last thing, before we judge the motor output, we need to assess the input. This is kind of me leading into just our physical therapy and like our clinical relevance to this. But before we have someone that can't, um, sticking with the lunge, before we have someone that can't just lunge straight and like basically in a, uh, your typical lunging pattern, what we need to do is go back and see why are they not doing it? Because like we, when we get our reassessments, we look at every muscle's motor and we look at their range of motion and then we see, okay, is there somewhere that's weaker than others? Because maybe that is a lacking that we can, something that we can strengthen up. It could maybe key us into what we need to attack. But also what if all the, everything's equal and you see that the muscle has the capacity and the muscle has the strength um, and range of motion is fine. Then what else do we have to attack? Maybe it's just the body using that variability to learn the movement, right? Um, and there was a, a study tagging onto like that ACL study. There's a study that stated um, performing ACL injuries when you look at valgus there is more correlation between having weak quad and then the valgus motion than just the valgus motion itself does that make sense so it's to me I kind of like put it like I frame it this way and I heard um, one of the other PTs from the courses that I've taken frame it this way as well is that is the movement actually the problem when we're uh, watching or looking at a movement? Is the movement the problem? Or is it that sometimes we're being forced to use a certain movement pattern that is actually the problem, right? So it might not always be the movement. If we go and look and everything is adding up, maybe the movement isn't the problem because they're just figuring it out on their own. Maybe the, the movement is fine. But then you go back and we look and we say, okay, maybe they, they do have some external rotation um, that is weak on the hips, or maybe they are lacking range of motion somewhere being forced to use that pattern is probably actually the cause for the movement pattern. And that is maybe more of a problem. All right, so then application and practice. So I kind of talked enough about the ACL launch example. I'm not gonna like dive too much into it here. In my head when I was playing this out, I didn't talk as much about this, but. Um, so, um, Basically what we can do in, when we're treating our patients, especially early on in rehab, and not even early on, like even when they're down the line, Sean, like what we can do is not over coach or I put not over therapist the situation. Make sure we know why we're saying the things we're saying. So if we see someone again doing a lunge, we don't just jump right in and be like, oh no, 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 knee has to come over your toes. What you wanna do is just say, maybe you don't do anything. Just let them kind of figure it out. Then when you have the chance, do the test or whatever you need to see if they're being forced to use the, move that pattern or if they're using it to kind of develop their own movement pattern in a way. Um, and then 
look for the optimal variability early on in practice. So when they're practicing these movements early on, you don't want anything going absolutely crazy. You don't want them crossing midline with valgus, but a little bit of valgus maybe in a lunge might be okay. A little bit of valgus or an out tubbing in the squat might be okay. It's them kind of learning their patterns and learning their movements. Uh, and then I'm just gonna do a case study afterwards, but we're just gonna go over the arm care stuff. Uh, but I mean, I just wanted to drive that home because we always kind of talk about like, I guess not over coaching, not over cueing, but also knowing why we're looking for certain things and not just jumping to conclusions because it's what we, we're not riding along this linear approach to, to movement. If A does B, to B does C, to C does E. You, you mean like, um, like, like suggesting like a cue and then like watching and then if they still can't do it, you're like, okay. Yes. I'm not gonna force you to like externally rotate if that's not how your body is able to do the movement, you know what I mean? Yeah, exactly. So. Say we have an ACL reconstruction here, it's their first time launching. There could be two situations, right? Where a, a physical therapist could come up to them and be like, okay, for a lunge, we wanna make sure we keep an upright torso, we wanna make sure our knee comes over our toes, we wanna make sure that we get onto the front forefoot of our toe and then push back really hard to come up to an upright position. Or physical therapists can say, hey, um, what I want you to do is just lunge out however you feel comfortable and then step back and then let's just see how you do it allowing the, that lunge over multiple reps for the second therapist that kind of just lets them act it out will hit, help the patient learn more about their body and that movement pattern than just kind of giving them the exact function on what they need to do because now perfect what the perfect is because now you're not really helping them achieve one general task and you're not helping them achieve it in the most optimal way what they're thinking about is an internal focus on getting to those specific, specific positions, mm -hmm. which isn't gonna deliver long-term or even short-term results in overall improving that movement pattern. Yeah. Does that make sense? And what would potentially also like be a risk of injury? Yeah, so if you take the variability out of exercises early on, then what happens when it's, they're running or they're lunging in a soccer game and it's way further down the line and there's been no variability in any program at all, then what, what happens, right? They, they can't, if they can't tolerate low variability inside a an closed environment, then what happens when it's an open environment and the, they have more variability within whatever they're doing? Yeah. Mm -hmm. I feel like this is just like super complex. Yeah. And it's like very task dependent. Mm -hmm. Cause like doing a squat and then like trying to hit a golf ball. Yeah. Two completely different things. Yeah. And like, I feel like you have to make a lot more adjustments with hitting a golf ball, especially like when you're like going at a different distance from a distant pl different place yeah on each so i don't know it just kind of gets very uh like complicated no no like absolutely and like i think that's t like the but then like walking is like a simple task but it's also like but what, really complicated yeah yeah and then I, you like break it down by yeah it. i think one thing that tim said that was like really important in that like i guess question or phrase but he said that like it's very task dependent and it is like super task dependent but when so let's look at it this way now what you just said, golf and walking are two things, right? Tiger Woods of golf, but you're basically the Tiger Woods of walking, right? Because you've been walking for so long, so you're past that expert level of variability, and now you can walk to him in snow or whatever, wherever else is going on. So it's almost like, yeah, walking seems a very mundane task, but to someone that's just learning how to, how to walk, so say take someone that's eight months old and they're taking trying to take their first steps, right? like the variability will help them with walking and learning that task because they're not analyzing every single thing to be like, okay, no, my foot, left foot needs to go uh, six inches in front of my right foot in order to take that next step. No, they're just doing the pattern and then when they fall, they get back up oh, and they like learn from what they did. Exactly. Trial. Yeah. And that, even that it kind of like goes into the whole like, just closed versus open environment. Yeah. Where it's like, if you just sit around, like sit on the arc and just shoot threes by yourself yep. in an empty gym, then you go into a game the next day, you're probably shooting like 10%. Yes, yeah, right. Yeah, we, someone, their hand in their face. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Or even or like batting on, on the move, like, yeah, right, on the move. From the dribble. Yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. And that, that kind of goes back into that variability and why you will see more like, uh, even if you watch warm ups in the NBA, right? They always have a hand in their face, even if it's just a guy like a coach playing dummy on them because they're mm -hmm. putting like variability into their practice rather than when you're obviously we're not experts like them, but if you're playing like high school or college basketball and you don't have all the coaches, maybe another player's are helping on your team, you know what I'm saying? Like just shooting there, someone might look a lot better than they actually are in game. Yeah. And then I, I wonder now that you're saying this, I have no 
correlation to this, never thought about this, but like, you ever hear the term like practice player? Yeah. And I wonder yeah, if that's yeah. it is because they don't have enough variability in their practice. They look really good yeah. when they're fielding ground balls at shortstop, but what happens when they're playing on a different field that's all turf and they get hit a sharp line and they don't look as good in there? You're like, oh my God, Probably. in practice, he would have definitely made that play, right? Yeah. Like yeah. in that sense, like they're becoming, it's like a casualty of not enough variability. Exactly. That in play. Yeah. Yeah. And I, yeah. So when you're first teaching someone like a new exercise or a new movement, um, would you like almost rather like demonstrate it for them without giving like any cues, have them just look at how you're doing them. And then when they go to uh, do it, they just kind of figure it out themselves without getting any cueing or like if they're doing it completely like wrong, yeah. then like you throw like a cue in there. Is yeah, so you want to go for um, the general concept of your question, I would say yes. And I would agree with like, should we just give them a task and they can perform it? And if it's wildly wrong, if we say, hey, can you do a lunge? And they end up like on their on their arm. Yes. Like, okay, it's wildly yeah, yeah. wrong. Then we give a cue, right? But um, if it's within like what we think is an acceptable scope, especially after a surgery, especially when you're learning a task, maybe we let them continue to do it and figure it out. And then maybe pepper them with like a cue here or like, okay, um, let me see you do a hinge. And we know like from a hinge, a lot of people get those like up on their toes. Maybe uh, after they do like four or five reps, if they're not getting it, be like, okay, John, maybe just sit back towards the wall a little bit. Mm -hmm. Because you don't want to take it out too early because then they're not doing the variability with what they can hopefully improve the movement with. Yeah. Um, Throwing too many like things at them at one time. Yeah. Like, yeah. Always just like over. I just had that conversation with yeah. the patient this morning. Yeah. Like yeah. you can't give too many cues yeah, because then you're ever coaching too right. much yeah. input, right? And then the output, if you're thinking of a nonlinear model, too many cues is going to probably result in a lesser output. Um, but the beginning part, visual, you said, should we just perform it? I don't know. Like, I, I haven't done, thought, dove enough research right now to think, is it better to perform it? Or is it better to say, hey, Zach, let me see you do it. Because some people might not know what a lunge is, right? right. Hey, yeah. hey, Zach, you're back from ACL reconstruction. It's our first time. Can you just do a lunge onto this foam pad for me and see what it looks like? Um, someone might look at you and say, what's a lunge? Maybe then you do it. Yeah. Or maybe you see what their interpretation of the movement is. Or maybe you have them do it on the good side first. That stuff I haven't really figured out yet, obviously. But um, early on, you're right. Like, let, allow for a wide range of variability, but make sure that the movement that you're looking for is inside that wider range. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I think a lot of times us as like, at least us in here, like we can pretty much do all the movements pretty well. Yeah. So like for us to show them that, and then, like, I'm just thinking of, like, a, like a lateral lunge, especially with, like, the landmine. Like, Matt Jaskill does it totally different than the way it would look when yes. I do it. Yeah, but yeah, you yeah. still kind of just let it go yep. because that's how his body is getting used to doing the movement. Yeah, you know? yeah. And, again, like, <clears throat> in no way is Matt an expert in right. landmine lateral lunging, right? But maybe in six months he'll be an expert at doing it how he does it, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's yeah, still yeah. getting the benefits. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And even from where he started, where he's yeah. now, like, right. he's improved, like you said, his variability. Right. Yeah, exactly. Like, where someone... his own motor pattern. And, yeah. Yeah, so he's creating his own motor pattern yeah. and what, what he's getting the input that he needs, which long-term, right, he had the variability in there. It'll probably lead to a decreased risk of injury because he developed that motor pattern and wasn't forced upon them. And again, that kind of ties back to: is he using the motor pattern because that's the motor pattern, or is he using the, the pattern because it's forced to being used that pattern? A little different way to look at it. Now it's an external, one of our coaches, therapists, saying this is how you should use the pattern, as opposed to he's being forced to use because he's weak. But it's still a force that's being taught to use the pattern, right? Mm -hmm. That's why I think like a lot of these. <clears throat> movement screens a lot of this like people that thinks like techie stuff that like over analyzes movement um those things that kind of help you like even like the posture things are the things that kind of help you do a proper lunge mm -hmm. it's not the best way to teach movement because there's absolutely no variability in that so how are you ever going to perfect or optimize a movement yeah. pattern when you're not allowing for any learning ability or any movement yeah. pattern like is there a perfect jump shot like steph curry probably doesn't have the most ideal jump shot form yeah you know, exactly like best, best shooter, shooter. yeah time. that's, that's, that's bowls in the league yeah yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> exactly but like yeah, yeah. exactly if you think about stuff like that but he is an expert at that specific yeah. jump shot he's the best like exactly. i mean you think alonzo ball compared to steph curry they look different and i'm not saying on the same level of shooting but for the sake yeah. of the conversation they are because they're probably in the top 0.05 percent of people in the world so for this conversation they are that they're experts at that specific shot but then imagine now we're gonna look at physical therapy a little bit but imagine that someone came in and said like 
hey Lonzo, actually no, you have to shoot it from over here. Yeah. And then that would have screwed up and probably not the same career trajectory. And now I'm gonna get off on a little tangent about when baseball players are taught to like do that upward swing because that might be the best bat path with a launch angle. Yeah. Well, that's really, really nice when you're in a closed environment and the pitch is coming on one plane. Mm -hmm. But it's not nice when we're seeing different pitches in different planes from different pitchers, from different arm angles. Like you have to be able to react to the pitch with a, a swing that is inside of scope of variability, yeah. right? Yeah. Um, yeah. Honestly, I think that the reason why people don't dig this uh, like theory of movement is that it's so complicated that they just want to make it simple for yeah. themselves. Yeah. Yeah. Like, it's easier to be like, oh, well, we just got to do it like this. Yeah, exactly. And actually like, put the like, thought into this. Yeah, the thought and time and like, yeah. the, like diving deep. And actually like even like PT school paid a lot of money for it, right? So it's hard for people to want to challenge beliefs when they paid all this money and stuff. But um, it's something you have to do. What's up, Rock? What's up? But it's something that you kind of have to do in order to become a better clinician, therapist, or coach, or whatever. Yeah. So I no, I completely agree that it's hard for people to want to challenge those specific beliefs when they're already kind of locked into their ways of thinking. Right. Mm. It's funny. I had a basketball coach that like tried to fix my free throw form, but mm -hmm. I was like really good. Like I was like. 90 percent yeah and then he like told me i'd keep my elbow in a little bit more and it like threw off my my free throws for like the rest of the season yeah like yeah. one time i think i was like a sophomore i was playing varsity but i was like in for baseball and i led like i was killing it in stolen bases and then one time my coach when we were at practice he's like he's like do you think you'd be able to steal more bases even more if like your um if your stride length was longer because your your things are kind of choppy and i tried it and ever since then like i was never as fast just because i tried it different yeah, right, yeah, yeah. yeah. Like they're trying to force you to do they, something else they brought in a dude like just to help out for like, a couple weeks on like you know when a running back starts mm. and they'll do that half step oh yeah, yeah so like keeping your weight forward yeah like thinking that that half step falls and like but it doesn't a year or two later like in grad school i write a, a like a 10 year long study that like that half step is like more beneficial yeah kind of, like you're yeah, like jumping maybe that free jump, like, yeah, it's better for like, everyone. So yeah, it's, like, and, really really and it gets you in like a positive yeah. shame, right? yeah, yeah, just right. things like that, like trying to switch things that you don't need. You don't need, they don't need to be fixed, right? Yeah. And you got to think about it, you were running back for at that point 16 years of your life, yeah. right? So you already perfected or, or at least really, really, really efficient yeah. in that one movement. Now, changing that is obviously going to have a detrimental effect to how you move and to go through the next sprinting pattern or kept, like, taking the ball. And like, sure, maybe if you were eight at the time, yeah, it might yeah. be a good idea. Yeah. But when you're, you've already developed that pattern and gotten really good at it, like you said, like, yeah, changing at that point is gonna cause more harm than changing, like, than improvement. You know? Yeah, I completely agree. Where did you guys learn the DS two from? I just so it was one side of the course that I'm taking now. I always like kind of heard about it, know about it. So then one, I have on my computer now, just from doing the presentation, I have like freaking 15 things I can print you guys out, like articles. Oh, right. But I, um, when I was taking this course, it was like a 20 minute, like really, really brief lecture. And then I just went down a rabbit hole. I just went, <laughs> 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 so I was basically digging all this stuff up. I was reading blogs and um, different like movement variability. Like this one that's still up on my screen is from Journal of, Oh, American Physical Therapy Association. There was just a bunch of different, different ones. Around. But I mean, I think it's really important to like dive into some of these deeper tasks than just to stick with like the basic stuff about ACL rehab, what to do at certain times. You know, it's important more to, to look at. Um, what if you were doing like an ACL, like uh, almost like preventative, like strength program with somebody? And you're screening them at day one. You see from a depth jump, they have valgus. Box jump, they have valgus. Uh, but then, like when you go to test, like their glute med strength, they have it's comparable yeah. side to side and bilaterally. Would you change anything, like from I mean that standpoint, to, or would you just... to start? That kind of brings us back to the um, to the I guess the conversation of how valuable actually is movement screening, yeah. right? Like, what what's the value there? Maybe maybe it is valuable if it's. Uh, inexperienced athletes right because they don't know yeah but it depends who you're screening it depends what they have going on if you so you're saying you do a screen go through in the athlete that you see that you said okay maybe the valgus that lady is not safe crossing the street yeah. <laughs> i watched her walk this way oh my god if she got her head down at her feet yeah oh my god so um so you're thinking like say, say an athlete no definitely not so say an athlete you go through they have a ton of knee valgus but they are um Strong glute meat, strong, strong everything. Every, yeah. The capacity is there. Well, then, what's why are we changing the movement pattern, right? Mm -hmm. 
it's just something to look at. But then maybe you go through, and and I think that's why a lot of studies come out now that like, uh, yeah, athletes that get injured had a chronic lack of sleep for um, less than six hours for the week leading up to the injury because you see so many different factors and subsystems that play a role in the injury that to say, hey, knee valgus is the reason for the ACL tears. Well, yeah, maybe it's playing a role. That's the mechanism of an injury, yeah. right? That's how the, that's the most stress you're placing in the ACL. But is it the full role? Probably actually a very small part of it because there's so much else that would be going on. Yeah. yeah. So realistically to perform a full screen, you would probably have to ask them about their sleep, um, nutrition, nutrition yeah. what kind of strength training they had, what kind of stress they have going on in school. Is school work a lot? Like you have to ask them about their general life. Take their like Q angle. Take their yeah. Q angle. Yeah. While, while doing a quick screen is good for like to drum up business and a marketing technique. Oh, I have an ACL prevention program. Like, no, you don't. Mm -hmm. You don't have a prevention program unless you're talking to the individual and not a general group of athletes. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Practice is going to be different for each. Yeah, exactly. So, so girl A that plays center back might have a different who can't perform a single leg squat might have a different prevention from girl B who plays defense or offense, whatever, a different position. That center back, I guess, is the defense. Right. Yeah. So, um, but <laughs> say she plays forward then, and Little she, guy. yeah, yeah. <laughs> so say she plays forward or whatever, and then she actually has like maybe some range of motion issues then there would be two different things that you'd be addressing. So you wouldn't even know the reason for the valgus during the screen, right? Yeah, so the valgus during Essentially, the Essentially, like, 100% prevention is impossible. No. Yeah. Uh, yeah, it's, it's nice, it's not, yeah, not obtainable. Yeah, definitely. Well, one uh, thing you were saying is, like, if, if they do have that valgus and then you find that there's, like, a some pretty significant, like, quad strength limitation, yeah. that could be, like, it could be beneficial to just strengthen those quads and then one naturally. Right. Take the value uh -huh. Yeah, so that kind of goes all the way back to the first thing of like, like right. the synergy. Like, synergy. We can't affect their sleep. Yeah. Yeah. We can't help their sleep, their nutrition. Yeah. That's but why we could so make their quality. Exactly. Yeah. Totally. Yeah, and that's yeah. why, like you said, Tim, like people don't want to think about it this way, but this is the way that it is. Yeah. Like, yeah, yeah, people don't want to like challenge themselves to think. They're like, oh, um, X and X rehab and whatever wants to do ACL prevention with the local high school. Okay, do you all land like this? Can you do it? Oh, wait, no. Yeah. It's, it's not realistic. Like it's, it's, yeah, it's just a selling point, which is, I guess, good for some people. But we're not going to go by that. Right. Um, yeah, but it's I mean, it's just, that everybody's yeah, different. Yeah, it's like, yeah, everybody's body's completely. Like, yeah, there's always individual differences. Like, yeah. what if I didn't have valgus, but I had like less power production on my lower extremities yep. from a non-valgus position versus a valgus position? Exactly. Am I gonna like sacrifice that power development when yeah. doing sports? Yeah. yeah. If you like force yourself angle. to get out of that valgus position, then yeah. you, you might also be increasing that injury. Yeah. yeah. And then if you think about tying into another concept that we always talk about, like if you got out of that valgus position. And then for the next week, you're doing every single thing in like a, just say a virus position, then your body, acute to chronic work, work right. ratio that you have him doing in the virus position yeah. is probably a more so likely to, to, injury, to get injured. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I was about to say that too. Like if somebody does have like an app, like a very, like a pretty atypical movement pattern, but it, like it works for them and you start with like a, like you, you've got them doing like squats or lunges. Like, should you start at like a pretty low load just so they don't have like an acute to chronic type? I would think so, yeah. Like, because they're they're piecing that movement pattern out. Mm. So like you wouldn't want to toss like heavy weight and have them kind of just like. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And that's almost like when we're talking about Jim, like watching on the treadmill now. He's a marathoner, but he has medial knee pain. Maybe we can like just nudge something in the right direction right. to get him out of that. But what if someone? I wouldn't want to rewrite his entire. Exactly. Class, yeah, or his his training program. But yeah. what if someone came in that just started training for marathons? A month ago and they say hey when I'm running now I have medial knee pain yeah. they have something different to look at you can look yeah. at all the parts but you can also probably look at some gate things and see what could maybe be causing that mm -hmm. maybe there is a part of the link that is suboptimal that we can do one thing right. and raise all like and that kind of goes back to even in like the presentation I did it was like runners are most at risk for injury like in their first two years of running yes yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. so that's basically maybe because they build up that tolerance right. using their own movement patterns right. through variability really that learning it out. yeah Exactly. Cool. That was good. Yeah. 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 Yeah.